The Winter Solstice Long ago, on one of the shortest days of the year, a Scottish family huddled by a fire. Outside, the winds raged and howled in the gathering gloom. The family believed that trolls and evil spirits walked the earth during late fall and early winter, when the sun was at its lowest point in the sky. But the father knew a Scottish ritual that would keep the family safe. He took three glowing coals from the fire and dropped them into a basin of water. Then each family member washed with the special water. They believed that the magic of the fire and water together would protect them from evil spirits. Hundreds of years ago, many people like the Scottish family thought that ghosts and witches and trolls wandered the earth. One especially dangerous time was the winter solstice, the first day of winter. On this day, darkness comes earlier than any other time of year, and the sun is at its lowest point in the sky. People worried that the sun's strength would not return. Without the sun's light, there could be no plants, no animals, no humans. With evil spirits everywhere, neighbors had to join forces. This was a time for goodwill, forgiveness, and love. Many ancient people believed that special rituals and ceremonies would help the sun be reborn. In some places, animals or even humans were sacrificed at the solstice. Priests dressed as animals or birds danced and chanted. They believed each detail of the ceremony had to be right for the next harvest to be good. Thousands of years ago at Stonehenge and other places in the British Isles, people placed huge stones together to frame the setting sun on the day of the winter solstice. As the red sun sank slowly in the west, the last rays of light gleamed through a special space between the stones. These people wanted to know when the sun would regain its strength, and they went to great trouble to mark the exact time this would happen. The ancient Romans had a special celebration at the time of the winter solstice. This was a week-long feast during which people changed places. Masters waited on their servants. Even criminals were treated with honor and respect. The Romans gave presents to their friends and relatives, just as we do now at Christmas. They also give each other candles. Roman businessmen would give his customers togas and silverware, and parents gave their children little clay or wax dolls. Coins and small gifts were hidden in pudding, and evergreens were brought indoors. In the far north, the sun disappeared for many days. After 35 days without light, the Scandinavians sent scouts to the mountaintops to look for the sun's return. When the first glimmer of light was spotted, the scouts returned with the good news. A great festival, the Feast of Yuletide, began. During this feast, men, not the women, sat in a long hall shaped like a boat and feasted around the fire while the crackling Yule log burned. The main dish was often the head of a wild boar, which was roasted with a fruit in its mouth. Fire and light were often an important part of the winter solstice ceremonies. In parts of northern Europe, people lit great bonfires to celebrate the rebirth of the sun. Some people tied apples to the branches of oaks and firs to remind themselves that summer would come again. They placed lighted candles in the branches of these trees. In Britain, the Celts also put mistletoe on their altars. In Peru, the indigenous performed four sun festivals during the year. The most important of these was the winter solstice festival. For three days, the indigenous ate no food. On the fourth day, everyone gathered in the public square before dawn to await the coming of the sun. When the sun appeared, shouts of joy rang out. The chief priest drank from a cup that was then passed to others. At the temple of the sun, a llama was sacrificed. Then the rays of the sun were focused with a mirror to make a fire. This fire was carried to all the temples, where it was kept burning on the altars throughout the year. Other indigenous people also had special sun festivals. The Hopi and other Pueblo indigenous of Arizona and New Mexico built sacred buildings called kivas. Slots in the edges of the outer walls of the kivas let in the rays of the rising and setting sun and moon throughout the year. The ceremonies that marked the return of the sun were carried out by Hopi priests who dressed in the skins of animals. The feathers in their headdresses were meant to look like the rays of the sun. Some of these ceremonies are still performed. Even today, the Cocutal of British Columbia change their names and take on names of their ancestors at the beginning of winter. They believe that this will protect them from the spirits of the dead who return at this time of year. People in North America and Europe still mark the winter solstice, but for many reasons, this time of year does not seem as frightening to us 
as it did to our ancestors. Today, when the earth is bare and brown, and the cold vanilla taste of winter is in the air, no one worries about the darkness or the whistling wind. People simply turn on the lights, pour themselves a cup of hot chocolate, and go about their business. Scientists now know why the days grow shorter in winter. The seasons are caused by the changing position of the earth in relation to the sun. If you stick one toothpick in the top of an orange and another toothpick in the bottom, you can see how the position of the earth creates the seasons. In a dark room, shine a flashlight, which represents the sun, directly at the middle or center part of the orange, which represents the earth. Tilt the north pole toothpick slightly toward the light. You will see that most of the light shines on the top part of the orange. This is the position of the sun and earth during the northern hemisphere's summer. Now tilt the north pole slightly away from the light. This is the position of the earth at the time of the northern hemisphere's winter solstice, when it receives less sunlight than the southern hemisphere. People living in the tropics near the equator do not have true seasons. There, the amount of light is always about the same, and the temperature is always warm. How do we celebrate the winter solstice today? You may have noticed that many of the things we do at Christmas and Hanukkah come from the winter solstice rituals of long ago. Like the Romans, we light candles, give gifts to our friends and relatives, and make special foods and desserts. Like the people of Northern Europe long ago, we decorate a tree and hang mistletoe. Like many ancient people, we celebrate the season as a time of love and goodwill. The winter solstice is still, for us, a new beginning. It's a time to hope that darkness will give way to light, and the world will be a better place in the new year to come. A Solstice Story This story was adapted from the Cherokee Tale of Creation. Look for signs of the changing seasons in the illustrations. Many moons ago, the great sun created the plants and trees. Then he blessed them with a gift of green, so that they might bring forth fruit and flowers. All was well for a time, but then the Great One withdrew his face. The winds came down from the mountains of the north, and grey clouds jostled above the earth. "'Oh, Father, don't leave us!' cried the plants. "'Give us your light and your warmth!' cried the trees. But day by day, the great sun sank lower in the sky, and the long nights were as black as the crow's wing. Then the vines began to wither, and frost touched the grasses of the meadows. A curtain of clouds covered the heavens. "'Dear Father, we will die without you!' wailed the trees and plants. Come back, come back. He's coming, whispered the north wind. There's a touch of gold on the mountain tops. He's coming, whispered the clouds. His face has turned in the sky. The plants and trees were full of joy at the good news. Eager to greet their dear father, they decided to stay awake every night and watch for his return. Sumac, sassafras, and purple aster put forth brilliant colors to welcome the great sun. But after a night of watching, they fell asleep. The dogwoods and alders watched for two nights, but soon their boughs grew heavy and they too fell asleep. The maples and poplars whispered to each other, We will not give in to sleep. But soon they were slumbering under the cold stars like the others. When the great sun came from his wigwam on the dawn of the seventh day, the skies were clear. He looked down on the forest and meadows below. The only plants and trees still awake to greet him were the pine, the fir, the spruce, the holly, and the laurel. For your faithfulness, I will give you the gift of green forever, said the great sun to the plants and trees who welcomed him. The others will drop their leaves or sleep through the winter, but you will remain awake. Your color will be a promise of my return to all who see you. And he sent a stream of light across the sleeping earth.